Welcome. My name is Kelly Bearden. I'm a classical musician turned creative entrepreneur, and this is the best platform for musicians that are looking to shape their career by thinking outside the box. I'm really excited to talk to you today, Nylan. I know we've obviously been working together for a while on the backside of things, but excited to talk about your career and dive a little bit deeper. Thank you for being here and for your time. And if it's okay to kick it off, why don't we start a little bit uh, with your childhood? When did you first start playing piano? Yeah, well, thank you for having me, Kelly. It's, it's always uh, a pleasure to talk with you. And um, I started playing the piano when I was three years old. Uh, I was put in lessons in Suzuki piano lessons by my parents. Um, at the time, my mother had started a very long career at the Metropolitan Opera as a soloist. And she, I think very early on, had a vision of me as her accompanist in residence. She just wanted to, she, she just wanted to train somebody who would be able to play for her. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I, I started at the famous School for Strings in, on the Upper West Side of New York, which was sort of the stronghold of the Suzuki Method in the United States in the 70s and, uh, and early 80s. And I, I love Mrs. Pine. She was kind of a low-key teacher. Uh, I distinctly remember her studio recitals in her home. And I remember going to theory and solfege and sort of rhythm classes at School for Strings on Saturdays when I was very young. So... Um, you know, I was, I was surrounded by music because of my mom. We, I grew up across the street from Lincoln Center actually. And so our whole world was just, you know, music. My dad was not a musician, but he was probably the most discerning audience member I've ever known. Uh, and my parents had a very tumultuous relationship and music and opera specifically was kind of um, the Laurel Branch that always brought everybody together uh, mm. around the dinner table. And so I always just associated music with my mom and peace and ha harmony at home. And um, so, yeah, I, I sort of grasped onto that very early on. That's awesome. And as someone that did not come from a musical household, I'm I'm curious, was it – pressure do you feel to to achieve at a high level or was it something that like because you were just doing it together you weren't really thinking about achievement competition it just happened um there was a very clear expectation that this is what I was going to do um mm. and I was a very compliant child I was fine with it I actually really enjoyed having piano be a part of my identity when I was little I had all sorts of like piano themed stuff right like notebooks and I had a, one of those little seals that you could put on your sheet music that said from the library of night you know I was very into being a pianist <laughs> like the um, oriental when trading I was very... poster child <laughs> yes exactly, yeah, exactly. And, although that didn't exist but yeah and um <laughs> and I was very into it and you know from a very early age i started accompanying my mom on hymns at church for instance mm. and i would sing little songs with her uh mostly at church and there was a lot of singing in my home of just like folk songs and family songs when we would get together with my mom's extended family that's what we did we sat around and we sang a lot of sort of americana songs from the early 20th century that my grandparents had grown up with um and so there was always an expectation that that's what I was going to do. And, you know, with the Suzuki method, my mom took very seriously the idea of practicing with me. Uh, the Suzuki mm -hmm. method's built off of that triangle, triangular relationship between the student and the parent and the teacher. And so she, she practiced with me. And I remember going to sleep, listening to the endless tapes is what they were called then. Cause like there's this listening component of Suzuki and they used to be these tapes and I remember book one, she would put it in a little tape recorder next to my bed and I would fall asleep listening to like long, long ago or go tell Aunt Rhody or um, so there was definitely that expectation. When I was eight years old, um, we switched to a different teacher. And this was a teacher who my mom um, knew sort of was just in our in our network and and um, she knew had a serious, a more serious studio. And so that's when I abandoned Suzuki. And, and I actually don't think Suzuki was a great way for me to start on piano. I've done it with my children on violin and cello, and I think it's brilliant on string instruments. For me, the primary 
skill that I needed was sight reading if I was going to really be the accompanist in residence. Um, and the Suzuki method didn't put me on a really strong sight reading path. And so I kind of had to catch up later in life on that. Um, but yeah, we moved to this um, much more organized, ambitious teacher when I was eight. And I stayed with her for about the next eight years. And she had a studio in California uh, that she ran in the summers. So she was Japanese and her family and her parents had come to California uh, after World War II and they'd settled in California. And so all of her extended family was there. And so in the summer, she would kind of decamped to LA and that worked out because my mom's extended family was there. So I studied with her in New York during the school year. And then in the summers, mm -hmm. I would go to LA study with her and the program that she set up there. We would do a lot of competitions there. And so I, I quickly became, you know, very competitive and um, a high level. And then when I was in, because I was living across the street from it, um, I went to Juilliard uh, for pre-college in ninth and 10th grades, um, which was a very interesting experience. Didn't love it. I ended up switching to a different private teacher for 11th and 12th grades. Um, before I went to Yale as um, a solo pianist and also as an accompanist. And I spent my college years um, working with singers in the Yale School of Music, undergraduate singers. So, so you know, this, the Yale School of Music graduate program has relationship with the undergraduate, right? So you can be in the music department of the college or you can be at the Yale Graduate School of Music if you audition into it, right? So. I auditioned into it and other undergraduate singers who had auditioned into the School of Music. Uh, I partnered with them. I started the Yale College Opera Company with a friend. I was the music critic for the Yale Daily News. And I worked on putting together um, really some interesting programs with singers and then accompanying them. So I would do two or three um, song cycle programs a year with singers that they would put together for classes or just independent studies or things like that. And I loved accompanying. I also sang in the Yale Glee Club. I was also in an acapella group at Yale. Um, so kind of music was my thing in college. Did you take voice lessons growing up too or only No, piano? I wasn't allowed to. I was deemed very <laughs> early on, it was deemed that I had no talent in singing. I had no voice. And oh, my dad, like, oh I no. remember, I have, I have these wonderful stories of memories of being in the back, because I was an only child. And so I got a lot of attention from my parents. And I remember being in the back of a rental car in the summer driving around the West. And we, we would go to Arizona and these long drives. My dad loved to drive in the old Cadillac sedan DeVilles with these huge back seats. And I would just kind of camp out in the back there, of course, no seatbelts or anything. And I remember <laughs> having like, Annie, the Annie soundtrack on my Walkman and like a Cabbage Patch Kids soundtrack. I also had the Tchaikovsky First Piano Concerto and the P Prokofiev First Piano Concerto. Those were my favorites. But I would sing along to Annie and my mom would always say things like, use your pretty voice, dear. Don't belt. You're going to hurt your voice if you belt too loud and too hard. You know, so they were, so they, so it was always <laughs> like this weird thing around me singing. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, and I don't have a voice. I don't have any voice, but I had enough voice to get into the Oakley Club because I think I was just a good musician. And in the acapella group, I was the alto too. So I was just doing like, like doo ops down on the, the very bottom. So I have no voice. Um, and I think they knew that, but it was always a kind of funny thing growing up. I think my dad blamed my mom at one point for, you know, sort of not, you know, protecting her self as the diva mm. and not wanting to allow me to blossom into her space I don't think there was any chance of that my voice is terrible but anyway <laughs> there, I do I, I did oh not ever have voice lessons did you grow up going to a lot of rehearsals at the vet too yes yeah. so great stories so you're going to get lots of my stories so I grew up <laughs> in the backstage of the Metropolitan Opera um when I was three my mom was singing Hansel and Hansel and Gretel um, and I went to a final dress rehearsal in the, in the main auditorium and they had to stop the rehearsal. I don't know who I was with. I was with a babysitter. I think they had to stop the rehearsal because I got up on the chair and I started screaming and crying. And I said, don't put my mommy in an oven because of course the witch was putting Hansel in the oven 
And they had to stop oh, the rehearsal. So and my, she had to, she had to c- come down from the stage. But tons of those you. kinds of experiences. <laughs> um, I actually sang in the Metropolitan Opera Children's Choir. I guess I did do a lot of singing, but I sang in the Met Opera Choir, Children's Choir. And it was fun because my mom was singing Suzuki and Madame Butterfly one time. And I was in the Children's Choir in that production. We were supposed to overlap in a couple of productions. I think we were supposed to overlap in like Boris Gudinov or something, some, mm. something else, or maybe Bohem. I don't know, but, but Suzuki was the one where it worked out and we were on, we were in the same production together. Um, and that was really fun. So. That's awesome. I grew up like laying on the steps of you know the, the church altar while well, my mom was in choir rehearsal for the church, but that was like completely different, obviously not, uh, no, not quite but as I mean, dramatic, but it was fun, so fun like to, just being yeah. around it like that. And I think yep. the exposure is so important too. That's something that I know, like I really appreciate about my childhood. It, Obviously sounds like these are really fond memories for you too. And just that kind of engagement where it is such a social thing in the family. Yeah. It's a really big difference. Did your mom, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, I think especially with, like, I didn't know the Beatles existed till like fourth Mm. grade, you know? And I, I was just in a bubble. And I think for the classical world specifically, you know, it's not something these days that a young person might just hear and say, Oh, that's my sound. Right. Like would that really resonate? That feels authentic. That feels like that's beautiful. I want to, I want to go in that direction. I, I think with classical music, especially it's important for young people to have that sort of relational, really, re, you know, relationship element to it where they feel like it's a safe place. Generally it's a warm mm-hmm. place. It, it, it has, you know, it's either, listening to your mom in the church choir or it's watching a rehearsal, like there's, it's an, it's a whole experiential world. Right. Um, And that it is my childhood and, and it is the thing that makes me feel um, safe and Mm. um, like there's goodness in the world. So. I was going to ask if you listened to anything else at home that was not classical music, but I think we just answered that one. <laughs> you know, my mom, my mom was really funny. Like, I think she, we, we absolutely, well, my dad was the one. So my dad took me to like a Reba McIntyre concert in Radio City Music Hall one time. My dad was the one, even though he was obsessed with classical music mm-hmm. and all the classical performing arts, ballet. He had, he went every single night to something at Lincoln center. That's awesome. Um, but he was actually the one that had the broader musical tastes. My mom loved musical theater. She loved the American mm-hmm. songbook. She loved um, sort of traditional musical theater. And, and that was definitely part of what she embraced, but like we stopped at about maybe 1960, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there was like, there wasn't a lot. I mean, you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber was out. No, you know, once you got to, I don't know, Avita or Jesus Christ Superstar, it was like, no, thank you. So, but anything prior <laughs> to that, um, she loved that as well. That's awesome. And did she perform musical theater at all or only opera? She performed it a lot on recitals. So like one mm. of the key, one of the, one of her signature songs was Can't Help Loving That Man from Showboat. Um, and I played that for her a million times. Um, she did a lot from Carousel. Um, she did a lot from, oh, what was, I was, yeah, I think it was from Carousel. If I Loved You from Carousel was a big one that she would do as a duet um, she, you'll never walk alone from carousel or, and a uh, climb every mountain from sound of music, you know, that she was a mezzo. And so she sang those sort of like the big torch songs from those early, early musicals. Hmm. I remember seeing in an article or it might have been Wikipedia or something that your mom at one point had held a pretty controversial role with the Met opera. And I'm going to get this wrong. Please fill in my memory blank as to what this was. Hmm. I'm not sure I would say it was controversial. I mean, the most kind of memorable experience she had, I mean, this might be what you're referring to, but Mm. um, in about in the, in the late eighties, probably about 1986 or 88, um, the Met did a production of Kurt Weill's opera, the rise and fall of the city of Mahagoni and Teresa. So, so Jenny is the lead character 
in Mahagoni, and Jenny is a prostitute. I don't. I don't know if this is. This I think this is, what you're I think this is where. I, yeah, okay. I think this is it. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so Teresa Stratus, who was a a, a, a famous uh, mezzo, was cast in the role, and this was kind of like you know, that those, those proverbial times when Leonard Bernstein steps in for, who was it, Von Karrion or Slatkin or something like that, right? And, and Teresa Stratus got sick. And so my mom was her understudy, was her cover. And so my mom um, stepped in as Jenny and then got the role another time that the Met did it a couple mm -hmm. years later. And I don't know if it was controversial. It was kind of funny, though, because like, here was this, lady with like this little kid at home playing this prostitute and um she also was at the time she was the leader of the women's group at our church mm. and so they had like they had like field trips of all the women from church to go see my mom in mahogany playing a prostitute <laughs> and and people will still come up <laughs> to me hysterical. and they're like we just absolutely loved seeing your mom like leading us on Sundays. And then the next week we went to go see her play a prostitute on the stage. So, you know, I don't, I don't know That's if it was, hysterical. it was kind of, it wasn't necessarily controversial, but it was a, it was a kind of a, a fun story. An interesting one. That's, that's yeah. fun. Well, Kurt Vile at the time too. I mean, obviously like when it's, when it was newer, it was also more interesting. I mean, it was, it was pretty yeah. contemporary at that point. So yeah, it exciting. was. And it, and I don't know that the Met has done, uh, Mahogany much since the 80s. I mean, another funny part of the story just personally was that the Met always did cast photos, right? So anytime mm -hmm. you were in a production, they would take your photo. And um, and my mom had a photo of herself and Mahogany sitting seductively on a stool with like barely anything on, you know? And my we had in our New York City apartment, we had um, a guest bathroom right off the front hall of our apartment. And my mom plastered the walls of that guest bathroom with these photographs from her productions. Oh, um, nice. And they were all uniformly framed, right? And so it was really cool. And it was floor to ceiling with these photographs. It's a tiny little bathroom, right? And for some reason, because we didn't think about it, because we were just w women, she put the photo of her as Jenny the prostitute right at eye level for where a man would stand <laughs> at the toilet to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Oh and so we That's had, like, I like it. <laughs> we had, well, she didn't think about it, but we had more than one man like come out of the bathroom sometimes and be like, Ariel. <laughs> anyway, oh, that is we, so funny. after oh, a while, goodness. it became a badge of honor and she just left it there. It was like, yeah. Oh, that's so funny. I've heard of Grammys and bathrooms as a yep. as a, an impression for sure. I have a professor that that did that, but that's hysterical. Oh my yeah. goodness. So at what age did you start accompanying your mom more full time or um, more regularly? I should see. say. So, uh, I would say probably about the age, it was definitely after I moved to that second teacher. So I would say when I was about 10 or 12, Okay. that's when I started doing, um, you know, uh, uh, opera transcriptions and, um, and, uh, really, putting together programs with her. She did a lot of church music, a lot of church programs. Um, she did a lot of, uh, she did Carmen a lot. I accompanied, she did both the Segadia and, and the Avenetta on pretty much every program. That was one of her signatures. So I started doing opera transcriptions about 10 or age, age 10 or 12. Got it. And starting an opera company at Yale, I mean, obviously that was, in addition to all your studies, probably a huge undertaking. How many productions were you guys putting out in a year? It was fun. Um, I did it with a friend um, who was an opera singer. And um, we we really just did, we did two a year. And I think we just started it, it we started it in our junior year. So in senior year, we did Julius Caesar. We did Handel's Julius Caesar. And then we did... Mm, I can't remember what the second production was, but you know, I mean, you're dealing with, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old voices. So you, you got to keep it very light and easy. Um, and uh, I was dating my husband at the time. So my husband was a guard in our production of Julius Caesar. Yeah. The costume, Has he reprised the, the role since? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's very tall. He's very tall. So uh, he was the tall guard. And, you know, it was like, please just show up all in black. That's your costume direction and hold a spear. And he was in an opera. So, Oh, that's awesome. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. So after Yale, things get a little interesting. 
Talk about what yeah. happened afterwards. Well, actually, we had a big move, I think, pretty much right away, right? Yeah, I moved to San Francisco okay. right after college, and I fully intended to work in arts administration. That's what I mm-hmm. wanted to do. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I also had been accepted at Columbia for to start a musicology, a doctorate in musicology. And um, I, you know, kind of with naivete and that young hubris, I was like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to keep going in school right now. I'll go work for a while and then I'll come back to the doctorate another time. And I just kind of thought it would be really easy for me to get a job in arts administration in San Francisco. Um, my parents had met uh, at the San Francisco Opera. My mom had sung there mm-hmm. for seven years before moving to New York. And my dad had been on their youth board um, and they had met in the back of the bus touring around uh, in the summers back in the sixties and early seventies. And I just thought, Oh, you know, I can waltz into San Francisco opera and tell them my story and they'll hire me. And I think I applied for 17 jobs at San Francisco opera over the course of a year. And I don't know what it was, but they didn't want me. And I tried the symphony and I tried a number of other smaller arts organizations in San Francisco. But meanwhile, this was the first dot com boom. And so eventually mm-hmm. I kind of just got swept up in that. And I took a PR job at a dot com that was kind of one of the fly by night, you know, party companies. Um, and it was a really interesting experience. And I found that I was good at PR. And so that kind of set me on a very different trajectory. I ended up uh, taking a long term job at Walmart dot com which was just getting its start there in San Francisco. I thought it was Walgreens. I'd never been in a Walmart. I didn't know what it was. Um, <laughs> and I was one of the first employees at walmart.com. And it was a wonderful uh, apprenticeship in sort of mm-hmm. general business management, general you know retail management and brand management. Um, online marketing was just starting at that time. So it was a, it was an amazing training ground for me. And I was there for seven years. And during that time, was it always the same position? What were you doing by the end? I did. I did a ton of things. So I was on the team that launched the first kiosks in stores. It seems like an eon ago, but um, you know, Walmart was trying to compete at that time with Amazon in selling books and CDs. And of course you can only have limited inventory in the physical stores. And so they decided to compete with Amazon by um, uh, by launching kiosks that gave access to the entire catalog of books and CDs, the same catalog that Amazon was actually tapping into at the time, um, you know, because they were just kind of like third party distributors. This was this was all very primitive days. Um, and so I was on the t- I actually did all of the text. I did all the copywriting for the that mm-hmm. those kiosks that went into the stores. I ended up my my uh, my time at Walmart actually being the merchant for the online apparel category. So, wow. I mean, it's part of Walmart's philosophy in, in developing general managers. They do this at their store headquarters in Arkansas too, where they 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 very consciously move employees around to, to like the sock buyer can end up doing online marketing the next year. Like it's a it's a mm. they sort of keep, keep rotate people around, and they were doing the same thing at the dot com in San Francisco. Well, it makes sense If people didn't have like PCs were not that common yet. It was still growing in popularity. You might not have internet access. So, you know, having something physical in store still made a big difference, obviously. Oh, absolutely. I remember one of the things that we marketed and sold at that time was the AOL Walmart co-branded, I'm going to say CD, but what it, what was it? It was like, you're too young to remember. Anyway, it was the way you got the internet on your computer. Yeah. Like the software. <laughs> drive. Like you have to like yeah. actually yeah. download it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So. Oh, I, remember, I do remember those days having to kick somebody <laughs> off the phone or <laughs> off yep. the internet to, to get on the AOL horrible mm-hmm. dial-up tone. Oh God. Yeah. It was terrible. When you transitioned out of Walmart, what happened next? Where did you go? Um, well, it, it, well, first of all, I guess sort of an important side note is that at that time, my mom was still singing. And so mm-hmm. I was still accompanying her and traveling around. Um, a couple things happened, though. Um, first of all, because I went to a computer job and I was sitting at a desk all day long, I started um, and then I would go home and practice. Um, I started having some uh, some some injuries. Um, yeah. My dad had thought 
at the time that a really great graduation gift for me would be to buy one of the very cool new Yamaha um, digital pianos that oh, yeah. um, could fit in a small apartment. So I, you know, it was cooler than an upright. So that's what he got for me. And it was obviously a very nice gender g- graduation present, but I think it, it, it had weighted keys, but I think, you know, coming home from using a computer and a mouse all day, coming home to that, um, it yeah. wasn't what, it wasn't what the, the, what those kinds what those pianos are today. And this was 25 years ago. And so I think that contributed to it. And so I started having a lot of pain in my right forearm. And then the other thing that happened is my mom got sick and, mm-hmm. um, she started having to wind down her career. She, she ended up uh, taking taking a university position and teaching uh, voice for the last about uh, ten years of her life, and she built up a um, uh, an opera program that went on to, you know, um, win lots of regional festivals. And she had a she had an endowed chair in her name by the time she retired. So she had a whole other career um, as she got older and stopped singing. So those two things meant that I and then I started having children and that made it tough too. And I didn't have a lot of motivation to practice anymore because I didn't really have anything I was working towards. And, Mm -hmm. um, the babies didn't love it. And my mom wasn't singing as much. So I, I really just stopped playing, which was very sad. Um, but I did continue with this, um, marketing and business career. Um, after Walmart, I stayed home with my children for a couple of years while my husband was in business school and, um, I started doing a lot of writing and sort of um, nonprofit work, uh, advocacy work, and eventually I returned uh, to an advertising agency where I was a brand strategist and worked on building brand identity and looking at competitive analysis and customer analysis and helping um, helping companies uh, sort of establish their their brand position in the market. And I did that for many years. Then I went to um, an educational technology company where I was the chief marketing officer. Um, and then I ran, um, a program kind of back with my advocacy hat on, I ran a program celebrating Utah as the first place a woman voted in the United States. And for about five years, I ran a a statewide nonprofit here in Utah that worked with the state legislature to, um, celebrate, uh, Utah's early role in the women's advocacy movement of the 19th century and sort of to try to reignite that kind of spirit here in the 21st century. So yeah, a little Can bit I of an eclectic right now path. That, that I, that you have a TEDx talk, I <laughs> which do. I think is so, so cool on that topic. Yes. And I remember when we first started working together, I listened to that one. That was, it, it's so cool. I, I didn't even realize that that was such a major part of women's suffrage and, and that whole yeah. history. So yeah. Amazing. The Utah women, Amazing. the Utah women were huge, uh, um, yeah, a huge, a huge force in that 19th century movement. That's awesome. And you moved to Utah quite a bit later in your career. Did work bring you out there? Or was it just family? It was really family. We moved here. We, we had ended up back in New York. Um, and my third child was born in New York. And at the time, uh, we were, we were just struggling to figure out, you know, school situations for our girls. And my husband wasn't thrilled with his job. And, um, I knew I was going to want to go back to work at some point. And our families were in Utah at that point. My mom had Mm -hmm. come to Utah for health care and my husband's family was here as well. And so we actually just picked up and moved here. We didn't have jobs or anything. We didn't have a house or anything. We just kind of knew we wanted to be here. And it's really been wonderful. Um, Salt Lake City is the smallest city in the country to have a full-time orchestra. The Utah Symphony is fantastic. Yep. And we have an opera, we have our Utah opera as well. We have Ballet West, which is one of the premier ballet companies in the, in the nation. And so it's actually a really, really great arts community. And um, so I was able to get involved in that. And, you know, I mean, I think elsewhere, I might not have had those same opportunities to really uh, get engaged and see top level talent at great prices and accessibility and all of that. So it's been good. Well, and we'll talk in a second too about your return to music, which has happened more recently too. But in all of the work that you were doing in marketing and in advertising, and, and I mean, I know it was a long period where you were separated more from music professionally. 
Was most of your performing at that point still centered around accompanying or were you performing as a soloist at that point and no, trying to apply I, that or, you know, playing more regularly in other venues? No, this was my tiger mom phase. <laughs> <laughs> I, I became a stage mom and, uh, and my accompanying moved from opera arias to Suzuki violin books. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, so I have three daughters. My oldest is almost 20 and she started as a violinist when she was three and we went through Suzuki with her and um, I, yeah, I just accompanied and helped them practice. And then I have um, my second daughter. We started her on piano. That just wasn't going to happen. It was either our relationship or the, the instrument. Um, she, we, she actually did three instruments with six different teachers. Um Wow. And yeah, it just, now she rides horses. So listen, awesome. it's not for everyone. And I'm the first one to admit <laughs> that. Um, but then my third daughter took to it as well. And she's a wonderful cellist. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I've, I, I have been in addition to the teachers that I grew up with, I've been in about eight different studios um, over the course of my children's own uh, lives. That's not counting the six teachers that my, my middle daughter was with. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I've had, I've been in numerous, you know, wonderfully run amazing studios with my girls and, you know, their teachers have been their mentors and their counselors and their therapists and their, uh, second moms and, uh, real partners in raising my girls. And so, you know, I think all along the way, I was just kind of remembering from my own experience, but seeing it from a parent's point of view, just being so in awe of what these teachers were doing for my children. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, my, my cellist who's 14, she just went away for a month to, to study with a bunch of um, conservatory professors at a festival. And she was really overwhelmed the first week. And um, she, you know, I, I talked to her and she called me and we talked it through, but at the end of the day, she needed to call her old teacher and she did. And, um, and she's like, I just know that Miss Brittany is going to know what to tell me. And I just need her special form of magic. And she did, she called her teacher and um, got her pep talk and kind of mm -hmm. just pulled herself up and had a great rest of the experience. So uh, yeah, just undying gratitude to all the wonderful studios we've been in. It's something that as a teacher, you find yourself into. I think we, we've joked about this too, that it's part therapy and part music that yeah. we tend to hear all, advise on all, support in all. And you know, think back at my relationships with my own teachers and the things that you confide when you're younger that maybe you don't necessarily want to always tell mom and dad, or you know, maybe the questions that you have about like going to school or adulthood that are a little bit scary. It's a safe place. But I also know on the on the back end, like when I get those emails from my students who are now in college or beyond, and they're asking questions and trying to to check in with me too. It's something you appreciate about that relationship. It's exciting to have someone that trusts you in that way and that knows that you know you can you can say the right thing in a situation and that you've been there for them during all of that. It's it's a really kind of a wild relationship that like yeah. one on one private time with an adult that you don't always get outside of the home. Totally. And I think culturally we acknowledge the power of that relationship a little bit more mm -hmm. in the sports arena, you know, all yes. the sports movies, right. Everything from, I don't know what name your favorites Friday night lights, right. Like <laughs> you're like, yeah, coach Taylor is like, obviously that guy, right. That, that like <laughs> change these kids' lives. And, um, and, and, and so we have a cultural expectation that that happens in sports and that, that there's that, that mentor and that sort of life force that can, and, mm -hmm. and that life guidance that can happen when you participate in team sports. And I think we, we just don't see that in popular media happening as much with music, but it's absolutely there. I mean, the, the, the best music teachers are teaching a life philosophy. They're mm -hmm. not, they're transferring skills, but they're, they're in the course of transferring skills, they're teaching um, really healthy emotional responses and um, life attitudes. And I think, you know, for my daughter, that's, that's what she loved about this first teacher, because she can say, you know, when I got frustrated with a shift or with playing a scale at a certain speed or something, 
um, these were the tools that this teacher gave me to help work through that, right? And those tools uh, deliberately considered and thought out and presented lovingly can be transferred to just so many other areas of life. And a good teacher will will have a plan for that and be doing it deliberately along the way. Um, and, and, you know, a, a healthy relationship in a healthy relationship that student will pick up on that being something bigger than just playing a scale. Yeah. It's, I mean, this, the amount of conversations I've had about study skills, <laughs> but I, mm-hmm. you know, all my students preparing for like SAT and ACT right now, totally. it's that time of year where it starts to kick in. And so the, the problem solving is important. Like we would get to work through anxiety and communication mm-hmm. skills and asking for help. I mean, that's, an enormous one when you just don't know what you don't know and you have to chime in. So at the same time, like you said, it doesn't always get glorified and and praised. And I think that a lot of parents aren't even always in tune with that. If they haven't been through that experience themselves, if they didn't take lessons growing up, they also just don't know what they don't know. And I know for a lot of teachers, this is a a stressor that we want to communicate exactly what it is that we provide and how we act professionally too. Yeah. There, you know, I think I do think part of it is that uh, that um, music can often be a lonely pursuit. It's often mm-hmm. um, it's often developed in an individual private capacity, right? And you, we have the image of like the boy going out and shooting hoops by himself for hours in his driveway, right? So, and 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 that and that's happening. But you also have the image of then coming together with his team. And yep. working through social um, challenges on the team, or using each other, having you know the team be able to build them up in certain ways, and we we don't have an easy equivalent of that in music um, as much uh, because you know it, we don't have like pee wee orchestras quite as much. Like yeah, I mean you can you know what I mean. Like any kid goes out and plays soccer and they do it badly and they're just kind of trying to run around and find the ball, right? Like you can't have an orchestra where the kids have just picked up a violin, right? Yeah. Um, and and so I think for me, the goal with my children was always to be able to have to get them to a level where they could have social experiences with music, mm. and that because that's what I loved about accompanying. I hated being by myself. I hated solo performance, but I loved it when I was in. I I had a couple chamber opportunities in high school, and then I loved the accompanying, obviously, and so. My goal was always I wanted to get them to a level of proficiency where they could play with other people. And it, it's absolutely true that with music, that takes a higher level of proficiency, at least with classical music and string yeah. instruments, for instance. I think with guitar and ukulele, for instance, that's one reason those instruments are more popular is because you can get to that that social team experience um, with with you know a lower level of, of, of skill and technique, um, which is great. That's totally fine. But um, but I think what that's one reason why classical music can seem a little bit intimidating is you do have to have a higher level of proficiency in order to you know have it be a group experience, have it be that team experience. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it, it, you know socially and in pop culture right now too, there are some areas where some of our more classically focused instruments are cool and fun. And, you know, like Lindsay Sterling makes a big spectacle out of it and it's fun. Um, But we don't really have a classical Taylor Swift. So it's not like, you know, we're selling out a selling out stadiums right now, but it is something that as you introduce students to, um, I know know one example, saw a presentation, I think this is last summer at the NAMM show, an instructor was talking about her school music classroom and, how beat making attracted a whole bunch of new students to her class. The kids were like transferring in mid year mm-hmm. in, in the first semester because they all wanted to learn beat making and their friends were doing it. And by the end of the year, kids were saying, well, I really like that sound from, from this song. How do I make that? Like what instrument is that? Oh, well, mm, cool. that's a, a trumpet. Mm-hmm. Would you like to learn to, you know, do you want to play that on, on your own? Okay. We're going to learn some things to get there, but we can make that yeah. happen. And then kids are picking up instruments too, because it might not be as obvious, but yeah, they are ingrained in our in our popular music still. Like we have to have those live instrumentalists. Yeah, absolutely. And and I I'm kind of waiting for the the musical movement that does 
you know, that does kind of bring them together a little bit more. I think, mm-hmm. for instance, one really good example, and, and I just, uh, uh, I feel like there's got to be a breaking down of the silos even even more. That's the area of originality that we have not yet explored um, yeah. in, in, in the music industry generally. I, I think that, and I think that, you know, with all of the, the chaos around AI, I'm hoping that that's an area where uh, real artists do start exploring is this idea of like, how do we no longer have these barriers and divisions between like, this is a symphonic work or a chamber work, and this is um, a popular work. And one example of somebody who's doing this amazingly well is Brad Meldow. Do you know the the jazz pianist, Brad Meldow? I don't think I do. Um, so he, we followed him for probably 20 years now. And he recently put together um so so he he recently released an album he's always done a lot of crossover stuff so he's classical trained classically trained but but clearly just an incredibly gifted jazz musician as well and he's always taken riffs from classical works um and put them on his albums and in his concerts and most recently he um he has a, an album that just came out a couple months ago of original compositions based on um, poems that he selected with Ian Bostridge. And Ian Bostridge is a, 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 a tenor who does Schubert leader and German art song concerts, like a British tenor, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of Britain also, um, yeah. uh, and they collaborated together on this album and it's just, it just, you know, it just defies genre, right? And and it's so interesting in the combination of these poems that he uses, E.E. E. Cummings poems and Blake poems and um, more contemporary poems as well, but they're all on this, this these similar themes. And he's just kind of mashed everything up and in a, such a virtuosic way that it feels popular, but it's like that very, it's such a high level of artistry um so i i really like i really like that um kind of exploration and i hope that we see more of that yeah i know an an example and the complete opposite end of the spectrum the first thing that came to my mind was we went a a few weeks ago now to a concert we live in wisconsin and milwaukee always has summer fest every year huge variety of acts they bring in I mean, everything that you can think of, I've seen like trombone shorty there like four or five times in the last decade. So like really, really great musical acts, but um, they brought in Odessa and I don't know that they've had an EDM act at this festival in the past. So it was a really big deal. And one of my friends kind of got us tickets. It wasn't like the top of my list to see by any means. I like know of Odessa, but I really don't know a lot of their songs. I was surprised at how much I actually recognized from the radio, but Mm -hmm. The performance ahead of time, Isaac was like trying to hype me up for it, of course. Like, no, you're really going to like this. You don't understand how much you're going to like this. And so he's playing me YouTube videos. He's like, there's a whole drum line. They have, they have live musicians. Well, sure enough, almost the entire show was played with a live trumpet, live trombone, and an eight piece drum line. And it oh, was eight. so cool. And yeah. it was, you know, it's choreographed too. Like there's a lot of, a lot of great things happening, but the quality of the musicians that they have is outstanding. Obviously it's a really yeah. highbrow act, but you have that like extra oomph of it being live. It's not a recording of a trumpet. It's not someone yeah. pushing a, a button on a pad and, and the trumpet sound plays, but you know, even to see the the two main guys from Odessa like conducting those mm-hmm. musicians and moments where the beat wasn't playing was mm-hmm. really cool to see like, you know, very uh, drum major <laughs> yeah, reminiscent yeah, yeah. from my own high school days, but it's nice yeah. to see some of that happening in live music again, where it makes it, exciting it makes it fun again it's not the same canon that we've had forever and ever and ever and it's not contemporary music that's so experimental that maybe it isn't as accessible to everyone right. it kind of falls in the, the middle of the popular culture it's fun yeah yeah and i love it and, and i've been reading all sorts of reports saying that live music attendance is just skyrocketing after covid yeah. both both you know all kinds of live music but but actually classical music is skyrocketing even in the united states i mean um so yeah I think people are seeking those experiences. There's hope for all of us yet. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, speaking of the kind of the return, let's talk about your return to music, which has been kind of a fun couple of years. You made a, a big career switch in, what was that, yeah. 2019, 2020? No, no, 2021. 
Um, I I wrapped up the, um, the suffrage project that I had been working on. We had been working towards some anniversaries in 2020. And so, um, yeah, I, I had an opportunity to, to do something very different. And I started talking with my husband, who's a very experienced businessman and said, you know, I, I really would like to get into arts administration all these years later. Um, (laughs) my, my original goal, um, and the, and so we actually decided that I would acquire a small company. And this is, um, this is not something that a lot of people realize that you can do because you think of buying a company and you think of like, you know, I don't know, some huge acquisition that makes the news. Um, it's actually, there's actually a massive market of, um, buying and selling small businesses. And, uh, you, you can do it through bank loans, small business association loans. Um, and so that's what we did. And I bought an existing software company called Music Teachers Helper, which um, was the original um, studio management tool for music teachers. It, it was been uh, uh, developed by the founder that I bought it from 17 years earlier. And um, it kind of I felt like it was a good place for me because I felt really comfortable with um, software and from my my tech experience, but also from my nonprofit experience, I was really I was really comfortable building communities and advocating for certain groups of people. Um, And I felt like and, and obviously I know the customer extremely well, which is something that, you know, uh, business owners should generally do. So between those three features, um, you know, knowing the customer really well, having experience in advocacy and building a community, and then having experience in tech and, and marketing, um, it felt like a really good fit. Uh, the one thing I didn't have any experience with was coding and development and actually building and maintaining a product. Um, And so that proved to be the big challenge because with a software product that old, um, we realized pretty quickly that we were going to have to rebuild the whole product. And um, I hadn't initially signed up for that, but we -hmm. took it on and we've been really grateful to our teachers uh, over the past two years who have been patient with us and who have been using our existing product and looking forward to the day when we could improve it for them. And so I'm really excited that that day is very close. Um, It's coming here in August of 2023. We're actually launching a brand new product. Uh, It's going to have many of the same features as our old product, but we built it on a brand new platform using brand new code. um, And hopefully it'll get us through another 17 years. It's really exciting. I mean, as a music teacher's helper, like, Obviously not, I, I don't think I used it for 17 years, but I did use it for, I think we're going on seven or eight, I think. I was in Amazing, college yeah. and I read a, a blog from Diane Heidi, who, great piano pedagogue who was using it at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, I'm doing all this in spreadsheets right now. So I'm absolutely yeah. going to pay the like couple bucks a month or whatever to to use yeah. that. But it was exciting to see the the change and the rebranding that you guys did immediately from Music Teachers Helper to Duet Partner. But yeah. this change is awesome. If I yeah, <laughs> may be able yeah. to say that. And seeing the previews and everything that we've we've walked through, it's going to be a huge game changer. Um, big question for you. And when you're trying to figure out like what to do in the revamps, what has informed some of these decisions? How are you deciding what to keep? What to, does not, yeah. you know, it's not going to stay in the program and how we update it for 2022, 2023 now. Yeah. So in the two years that we spent um, sort of becoming, in the two years I spent becoming familiar with the product, deciding how to move ahead, uh, trying to retrofit the existing product and then deciding that we needed to rebuild it. All of that. One of the things that, one of the things that I was doing constantly was talking to teachers. Um, so either through, customer service portals or by doing demonstrations for those who are interested in the product um, or going to conferences. I've I've talked to hundreds of our our customers and potential customers. Um, And then another thing that I did was when we decided to rebuild the product, I actually decided to start from the very beginning of a business development process. And um, I, I come from a sort of business philosophy of 
um, the, the it, it's kind of popularized in, in a book called Nail It and Scale It. So um, the idea is that previously in, in prior eras of company building, it, there, was, there was sort of this philosophy of like, if you build it, they will come, right? We're going to build something amazing and everybody will want it. And, and that was flawed in many ways and many companies failed because they built something that nobody wanted. So um, even though it kind of killed me for a while because I felt like I was going backwards, <laughs> I decided to go back to Ground Zero and just start interviewing teachers about what they wanted in a product. And um, that was really important because I feel like after two years, I was so kind of like tangled up in what the product already was mm -hmm. and just kind of putting band-aids on it that I had never really um, stepped back and said, okay, if we were building a new product in 2023 with everything we know now and all the tools that we have at our disposal now and the, and the, and the contemporary challenges of teachers today, what would it be? Um, and so I, I did um, dozens of, t of customer interviews, long discovery interviews where we just talked about like, you know, how do you manage your studio? What are your challenges? What would you like to see? Is there a tool that you use? You know, and, and the goal has always been to have Duet be a single login solution for teachers' digital needs. Um, we want them to have a tool at their disposal that um, precludes the need to have other accounts um, and other tools and other costs and other monthly charges, right? And so a lot along the way, um, the big insight really was that teachers don't necessarily want a tool like this to save them time, which was really the, our primary marketing message in the past, like save eight hours a week by streamlining all your processes. That's sort of the standard um, marketing message. The big insight from those interviews was that teachers need a product. They want a product that helps them feel confident. Uh, they are not trained business owners. They, you've, you've all done your 10,000 hours in something completely unrelated, right? You've done your 10,000 oh, yeah. hours of scales and you've done your 10,000 hours of sight reading and orchestra and excerpts and whatever, but you haven't done 10,000 hours in collecting payment and, um, you know, all of that. So, so there's a lot of anxiety around that process. There's a lot of self-doubt and that translates to being, um, to lacking confidence when it comes to interacting with your studio families. And so the other insight was, you know, confidence in running a business translates into confidence interacting with parents. And so, so the new tool that we're building and, and a lot of teachers would tell me like, oh, I would, I would definitely take professionalism with parents over saving me time. And that was a big, hmm. that was a surprising insight because we always assume people would want to save as much time as possible because as a teacher, you're often trading time for money, right? Like an hour of your time is worth 60 bucks or something because um, you could be teaching, right? But, but that was a really powerful insight is that they want to feel competent they, and you want to feel competent and you want to feel professional when you're interacting with studio families and with parents. Um, so that really became the guiding principle of, of what we're doing with the new product. Well, and it's important too, in thinking of my own studio past that, you know, when I was teaching in undergrad and in grad school, I, I can think of many, many specific examples, but I think one that's a little bit more pertinent is I had someone who worked in banking, a parent that worked in banking, and they had paid their invoice late for the third month in a row. And when I said, I'm really sorry, I can't waive this month's late fee because it's the third month in a row. And um, they didn't like that answer that they told me this is not how you run a business. This is not how, you know, businesses operate and, and kind of tore into me. And I somehow in that moment found the confidence to say, well, surely if I paid my loan back to the bank late, there would be a fee. Yeah. But um, I think even like a year or two prior to that, I would not have had the guts to say that, but that ended the relationship with myself and that family. And I think it was for wow. the best. I adored their child wonderful, wonderful kid, great student. I loved working with them. But at that point, you know, at a certain point you lose comfort and it obviously wasn't working mm -hmm. anymore and that's fine. But 
if we let parents who have more business knowledge and acumen walk all over us, you know, we, we find ourselves in positions where we're taking lesser pay or we are not being paid the amount that we need to be, or the schedule is really, you know, kind of lackadaisical. And there's a lot of, you know, instability and lack of predictability in your business. And that causes enormous stress. So I understand that professionalism desire because it's not so much, um, you know, the saving time is amazing. And at the same time, it, it's not that I want to enforce everything hundred percent and keep my, my policies held, you know, at a hundred percent all the time, but just that when I do enforce them, I want to be respected. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's yeah. huge fear in that. It's a lot of what our clients talk about too, is how do I handle this, you know, maybe a little bit more abrasive email or phone call that I'm getting from a parent. What do I say? How can I handle this well and come out still as professional? It's tough. Yeah. And, and I know that you and I are the, on the same page on this because, you know, um, one of one of our goals at Duet in the long term is to absolutely raise the profile of the industry among the client base, among the, among the studio families, among the parents. Um, and, and we do that partly by getting more and more teachers to have that self-respect that you're talking about, but also to give them the tools to be able to act on that self-respect, right? And um, because it's one thing if you say, you know, you have to pay me on time, but I only take checks, <laughs> right? And it's another thing to say, you have to pay me on time and I'm going to provide you with four digital payment methods that, you know, yep. make it really easy and you just have to click here and there's no excuse, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's that's really what we want to do. We want to raise the confidence level of teachers everywhere so that if they want to run a professional business, they can, right? There's always going to be people who want to be the neighborhood music teacher and will take a check in the bowl on the top of the piano. But but if you want to have this be your livelihood and you want to have this be um, something that, you know, makes your PhD worthwhile or even just your whatever training you've had, you know, um, then we want to provide the tools to to make that happen easily. That's awesome. And it's an important part of what we're dealing with right now, too, that I think is there's been a huge boom in um, accessibility for lessons with online lessons. There's, I think, even more of a pressing need for this because people can Google piano lessons and find 57,000 options for, um, you know, places that are based on their countries and con conversion rates are going to be definitely mm -hmm. in favor, especially for our U S based teachers that you can get a really, really cheap online lesson. And mm -hmm. it puts more pressure, I think on the industry as a whole here that we have to be providing a really good professional, high quality service so that value is apparent from day one. And we're not you know, shorting ourselves or, or taking a huge pay cut just to compete for the sake of competing and getting yeah. all those students too. So I completely agree. And with everything we're talking about too, hopefully there's this, you know, continued uh, return to live music and students want to keep learning those instruments. And, you know, the more we can promote this and, and share the responsibility together as a community and remove the competition, I think, between all of us to come together in that goal. It also means that we're all succeeding and winning and that's really important. Yes, absolutely. I am very excited about the new duet partner launch. If I can like shamelessly plug, I mean, I've, like I said, I've seen what you guys are doing. Um, we've kind of been working together a little bit on the back end too, to, to um, kind of build some of this, uh, even like questioning teachers and, and trying to do some of that market research. And it's exciting to see a, a company moving in that direction as opposed to just the efficiency model. And at the same time too, uh, I'm excited for our teachers who are active Duet partner users to to see what's coming on the pipeline because it's awesome. Yeah. I'm really pumped. So, well, can I can I'm I give a, a little preview? I'm a tiny preview? bit biased. <laughs> yes. Yeah, please do. Well, you've been please a wonderful do. help. I just give a quick preview of, of what's coming. Um, so, here in August of 2023, we're going to be launching uh, Duet with uh, three specific features. Uh, we've decided to uh, follow this nail it and scale it approach by just putting something out there, getting the feedback, uh, iterating, changing, responding uh, as needed, and then just growing a little bit at a time rather than, you know, building the whole thing and putting it out there and saying, ta-da, you better like this, right? So um, <laughs> so we're, we're leading with three features. Um, the first is a student information organizer. This is very similar to the feature that we have now where uh, there's uh, student profile pages and you can sort your student list by a number of different criteria and variables. You can also communicate with them directly through the program. 
send out newsletters to your whole studio. You can filter for just students that are on a particular instrument or at a particular level and communicate with them. Um, so there's sort of a built-in uh, email communication platform as well in that student organizer. Uh, we also have our calendar feature, which is also similar but improved to what we have now. Um, it's a, a lot, very similar to a standard uh, calendar feature that you'd find on your phone. For instance, you can create individual lessons, recurring lessons. The great thing about ours, of course, it's different than something like Google Calendar is that when a lesson happens, you can both set the attendance, which helps in record keeping, um, and you can also create lesson notes and add them to the lesson, email them to the parent and to the student, et cetera. So you have a record of the lesson and the notes are contained right there in the student's profile and are easily accessible in one place. Um, and then the third feature that's going to be included with this first rollout is something that came out of those discovery interviews. And it was really a, the chief pain point that we found with teachers when we were interviewing them. And it, ironically, it is a time saving measure, but um, it's also has a big professionalism element to it because um, it streamlines the communication that teachers have to do with parents around setting up a new teaching schedule. So it's called smart scheduling, season smart scheduling. And it's the process by which the teacher's availability is paired up with the student's preferred lesson times. And an algorithm magically puts it all together to produce a draft teaching calendar um, that can then be edited and manipulated, um, you know, because they're always going to be special cases. But uh, it gives a it gives the teacher a foundational starting point um, that kind of cuts probably dozens of hours out of the equation as you're preparing for a new teaching schedule. So it's um, we're very excited about that. Now, obviously, I'm not mentioning anything about billing and payment collection. Um, that is coming. And we're very excited about how we're going to be expanding the ways to pay and collect. Um, and we're also going to be advancing the self-scheduling model so that teachers, so that uh, students can schedule their own lessons, teachers can schedule trial lessons, makeup lessons, group classes, and have their calendar kind of accessible to their studio families. So good things are coming um, by the end of the year, but it's not, it's not a complete product yet. Um, so anybody who's interested in joining, we encourage you to, to sign up now. Um, there's definitely some special offers and cost savings for doing so earlier, but just be aware that some of these other features are coming later this year. It's exciting to see this process, and I, I have seen you through the complete rebuild, like the small updates and then kind of burn it all down and start over process, which is a really exciting move, and I'm, I'm happy for you guys and excited Thanks. to use the product I'm myself. Like selfishly yeah. so ready for season smart schedule for my own studio. Um, yeah. And I know our, our clients that use you know countless Google Forms and, and spreadsheets and all that fun stuff will – Absolutely appreciate it. So thank you for all the work you're doing on this. I'm very excited. And also thank you for sharing your whole career with us. It's, mm, thank it's you. such a fun, I'm... interesting, like <laughs> twisty, turvy story. I just love it. It's fun hearing more details. Yeah. Well, well, it's fun sharing those stories. Yeah. They sometimes feel like they're kind of from another life, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's fun to relive them. Uh, maybe a final question for today. What has been the best thing about coming back into the music industry and taking on this role in the last few years? Oh, I mean, working with music teachers, they're, they're simply the best. Like I, I do, you know, I, I am not one, but I, 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 I taught a couple of piano lessons in high school, but as I said, you know, it's fun to do something where you feel like you can use your skills on behalf of your heroes. Right. And um, music teachers are, they are, they are the heroes in my life and in my family's lives. And so I, I feel like it's a, it's, I've always worked in sort of, cause oriented uh, environments, even the advertising agency I worked at for many years, we did nonprofit and cause oriented clients, that was our specialty. Um, and I've worked, you know, on built nonprofits, etc. So it's it's fun to have that element to this product as well. To, um, it's a for profit business, you know, I I'm building software, but it's um, in, in behalf of on behalf of a of community that I really believe in. So um, and I get to talk about music all day and you know what I'm actually talking about, which is so fun. So that's, that's great. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much for your time today, Island, and for sharing. I have been looking forward to this. I know we've been talking about doing it for a while, so I appreciate all of your insight and, and all of your time. This has been a ton of fun. Thanks. Fun for me too.